It's really great to see this significant step forward um, in how the, the field is evolving. You, you may be wondering um, what these strange Olympic rings are behind my head. Um, they are actually the front page of the new impact standards report. And uh, we were just discussing their relevance earlier. And we think they indicate um, ambition, but realistic ambition, training required, but worthwhile uh, once you've reached the standards that uh, are um, being put um, together for you uh, on impact. Uh, and just to give a little bit of background on um, the, the mechanism by which the standards have been approved at the OECD. So the OECD, Development Assistance Committee, often referred to as the DAC, uh, improve, approved the standards by silent written procedure on Friday 26th of March 2021. And the standards are designed to support investee um, donor countries and organisations in the deployment of resources through development finance institutions, often uh, abbreviated to DFIs, and of course private asset managers in a way that optimizes a positive contribution towards the, the, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals. So a really important piece of work here. Um, and I think more generally, the standards also represent a, a framework for all organizations that are looking to demonstrate public accountability regarding the measurement and management of impact. And that, that's the broader roadmap that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the standards were, um, were enriched by a long 10 month period of consultations during the course of 2020 with stakeholder representatives from the donor community, uh, DFIs, as I mentioned, asset managers, civil society organizations and, and impact measurement and management experts, some of um, whom we'll be hearing from today. Uh, and we've got a really stellar lineup for you um, at this launch um, session. And some of those leading impact policymakers and practitioners are with us to discuss what the standards could help achieve uh, and what they mean uh, to their organizations. But as ever, we want to make this um, as interactive a discussion as we can. And we're, we're keen to make you feel as involved as possible in this event uh, and in the overall process. You can join the conversation on social media using the hashtag impact for SDG across any of the following platforms at OECD Dev, at OECD Development, uh, OECD On Development or OECD Development Cooperation. I uh, hope you managed to get those down. Um, don't forget also, it's, this is really important that you um, give us your questions on what you hear this afternoon, particularly during the, um, the, 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 the panel session that we have. And you can put your questions to the speakers in the chat box. And, and I, as chair of this event, I really like to seed questions into the conversation as we go. So the earlier you get your question in, the more chance uh, of it getting answered and we can get that to our, our great speakers. Um, I'm really pleased to say that to kick off today's event, um, we have a great set of live introductory keynote remarks from uh, OECD Development Cooperation Directorate Director, George de Moreira da Silva. Uh, and just be before we hear from George, a few biog notes about him. Um, so before, before he uh, took up the director role of the directorate, he served as Portugal's Minister of Environment, Energy and Spatial Planning. And he was senior environmental finance advisor and program manager on uh, climate change innovative finance at UNDP's Bureau for Development Policy. Uh, he's had a long um, history of political um, appointments in Portugal and been a member of the European Parliament. Uh, and since 2011, he served as founder and chairman of the Lisbon based think tank platform for a sustainable growth. He also served as first vice president of the executive board of the Partido Social Democrata. I hope that pronunciation wasn't too mangled, uh, George, but uh, great to have you here and over to you now um, to hear your opening keynote remarks. Thank you, Luke. It's, uh, it's great to be with you and with uh, Fabienne, uh, Julia, Cliff and Andrew, and also hearing from uh, Susanna Morhead and uh, Marina Sereni, the Vice Minister from, from Italy. Uh, as you can see from the level of participation, uh, impact uh, investment is on the rise. And I think that the adoption of this uh, OECD UNDP uh, impact standards for financing sustainable development was 
uh, expected for uh, um, a huge uh, number of constituencies, uh, of course, within the development cooperation arena, but well beyond knowing that these norms and standards can be inspirational for other efforts that are taking place uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, impact investment. This work uh, is the product of 10 months of rigorous consultation uh, with representatives from donor governments, development uh, finance institutions, uh, asset managers, uh, civil society organizations, and impact uh, specialists. Many of them are with us today, culminating in the formal adoption, as you just mentioned, Hugh, uh, by our Development Assistance Committee on uh, 26 uh, March. Uh, I would like to thank all the experts and practitioners that um, contributed to the development of this uh, document for their constant commitment, uh, support, and feedback. This is a real joint product uh, and the public good, of course, uh, you don't mind if I extend my appreciation and, and, and thanks to my team, uh, Haya Schutt, uh, Paul uh, and Priscilla. Today, impact is much more than a trend or a niche. Uh, measuring the impact of our investments uh, on people's lives and the health of our planet is now fundamental, increasingly integrated into mainstream thinking. This uh, theme is going to continue to increase uh, importance uh, in the development cooperation agenda throughout 2030 and, and beyond. There is also an urgency to get this right. Uh, uh, there is no silver bullet. Uh, this is on the rise. Uh, it's a trend, uh, but getting it right is fundamental, especially in this context of building back better. In the 12 months following the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic, Standard & Poor's analysis fund uh, ESG funds uh, outperformed traditional ones, rising between 27.3% and 55%, compared to Standard & Poor's 500 average of uh, 27.1%. At the same time, uh, 2020 saw the US, the world's uh, largest economy, suffer $95 billion in damages from climate-related catastrophes alone. Uh, the political ground is shifting. We, we know that. We have observed even from uh, uh, last week declaration of G7 ministers of environment and, and climate. In 2021 and beyond, sustainable investments with long-term horizons will be increasingly critical to planetary as well as uh, business model resilience. At the same time, we as official donors, uh, stewards of taxpayers' dollars, uh, have a responsibility to ensure companies are not greenwashing, that they pursue sustainable uh, investments with integrity. We know that yes, you do due diligence alone is not enough. Uh, if we are still to stand a chance of getting back on track towards 2030 agenda targets, um, uh, we need to turn our attention to the impact of our uh, investment. That's why these standards are needed. They are designed to support donors in the de deployment of resources through development finance institutions, the DFI, uh, and private asset managers in a way that optimizes the positive contribution of investments towards the SDGs. These standards uh, are a best practice guide uh, and self-assessment tool and, and are freely available for subs subscription on a voluntary basis. Uh, they are a framework for all organizations with a desire to demonstrate public accountability regarding their uh, measurement and management uh, of impact. The structure of the, of the standards is uh, based on four distinct but overlapping uh, areas. And I know that my colleagues have put in the chat the link to, the, to these uh, standards. Standard one on strategy. It provides guidance on embedding impact consideration into aligning organizations' purpose. Standard two, management approach. It indicates how to integrate impact considerations into operations. Standard three on transparency underlines the importance of disclosure, both on how impact is integrated into purpose, strategy, management approach and government, as well as reporting on uh, performance. And lastly, standard four on governance looks at how aligning organizations can reinforce their commitment to impact through their government, the governance practices. Today, 
the COVID-19 crisis has renewed the pressure on both governments and investors to use their resources in the most efficient and effective way possible by implementing these standards, living up to their provisions uh, and committing to continuous improvement. Donors, DFIs and asset managers can really help push for a more impactful and transparent use of development resources. We'll hear more from uh, 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 our panel today. They will share with us uh, more about uh, our organizations are actively working to integrate impact into decision making, increase impact integrity, and provide better uh, evidence of impact and about challenges they, uh, that lay ahead. Um, to conclude, the approval of the standards uh, is a key milestone. However, this is just the beginning of a journey. We now need to move collectively uh, to implementation. To support this, uh, the DCD, the, the OECD uh, uh, Secretary uh, is currently working on a detailed implementation guidance notes, note, uh, which will help organizations put the standards into practice. We'll also conduct pilot studies, which will test how the standards work uh, uh, in different uh, contexts and sectors. We are very excited about this agenda, and uh, we really thank uh, not just for the presence today, but for your continued uh, engagement. Thank you, Yuk. Great, thanks, uh, George. So that's, that's a, a brilliant um, short oversight there of the standards. And as you mentioned, um, uh, your colleagues at the OECD have posted into the chat uh, a link to the um, to the standards and also where you can um, uh, tweet or um, LinkedIn post on today's uh, launch sessions. Um, I see your questions coming in as well. Keep them coming. We will um, we'll put them into the panel session and get uh, some answers from our uh, from our panelists. Um, and uh, one question that came in was about the recording for the video. So this will be recorded, and, and the uh, the session link will be sent out to to everyone subsequently. Um, we now go over to a few short um, video segments for some excellent. Uh, speakers to follow, uh, George. First up, we've got a three-minute video message from OECD Development Assistance Committee Chair Susanna Moorhead. Before we run that, just a very few biog notes on Susanna. She's had a, a distinguished diplomatic career in international diplomacy uh, and development spanning over 30 years. Before taking up her role as chair of the OECD's Development Assistance Committee in February 2019, uh, Susanna served as British ambassador to Ethiopia and Djibouti and UK permanent representative to the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, she previously served as the UK's executive director to the board of the World Bank and was director of West and Southern Africa at the UK Department for International Development uh, and head of DFID in India as well. Um, she directed field-based famine and rehabilitation programs for Save the Children in rural Mali uh, and was Deputy Director of the Institute for Development Studies in Sussex until 1997. Let's hear from Susanna now. Pressure on official development assistance is greater than ever during this dreadful COVID pandemic. Central to the Development Assistance Committee's response is to make the odour we have work as hard as possible to deliver the sustainable development goals and to help rebuild the recovery. One of the ways we do this is through blended finance, mixing official development assistance with private finance in order to make it go further. But as we use these instruments to increase the quantity of financing available for development, we mustn't compromise on quality. And this is where the recently approved OECD DAC UNDP impact standards for financing sustainable development come in. Why do they matter and what do they mean? They matter because they help DAC members and partners deliver the best possible outcomes for poor women and men in developing countries. They matter because they help show taxpayers in DAC member countries that resources are being used as effectively and efficiently as possible. And they matter to help us live up to our standards and values of accountability and transparency. What does it actually mean to have impact standards? Let me try and give you one or two really concrete examples. If we're combining official development assistance with private finance, say in uh, solar panels, 
it would be now essential and indeed mandatory for that project or programme to record the impact of that investment on the relevant sustainable development goal. So it could be uh, SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy, plus SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities, and of course SDG 13 on climate action. So it will be possible for donors, recipients, multilateral organisations, taxpayers, people in developing countries to know precisely what the impact of that investment has been. It may seem like a rather technical solution to a complex problem, but the importance of these standards are that they make it clear what we are managing to achieve and where we need to do better. They are shining a light on development cooperation and why it works and why it changes lives. And I'm delighted that we have made this important step in improving our commitment to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Great, our thanks to Susanna for her intervention. Um, now, the OECD team are going to tee up a, a very short 40 second animated video about the application of the standards for investors and what they aim to achieve. It's a quick interlude before we come to our next keynote. So we're gonna run that video for you now and then we'll get to, to our final recorded keynote this afternoon. Welcome back. We're delighted now to hear from Marina Sirini, Italy's Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Uh, and before we do, uh, just a few barred notes on Marina. She uh, was active in student organisations and the movement for peace from a young age. Uh, she's had a distinguished political career prior to becoming the Vice Minister in 2019. She was a member of the Democratic Party's National Secretariat. Uh, before that, in 2013, uh, Marina was elected Deputy Vice Speaker of the Chamber of Deputies and was a member of the Foreign and EU Affairs Committee. We're really pleased to have Marina here today representing Italy, uh, who have been a committed supporter of the OECD's impact standards work. And if we could run that video. Dear Director Moreira da Silva, dear Chair Moorhead, dear speakers and participants, in my capacity as Italian Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, I am pleased to introduce today the official launch of the OECD UNDP Impact Standards for Financing Sustainable Development. We, as donor governments, have established evaluation criteria for the use of official development assistance. However, today there is still no equivalent for private investments. Nevertheless, we need the private sector on board to help address the US dollar 4.2 trillion funding gap in developing countries. This is necessary if we intend to unlock the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. We observe encouraging signals. Public appetite for sustainable and responsible products is clear. The sustainable investment space, too, is growing rapidly. Indeed, as we continue supporting developing countries in finding their way out of the COVID-19 pandemic, and building back better, we need to encourage investments with positive social, economic and environmental impact. In recent years, multiple initiatives to assist private investors in managing and measuring the impact of their investments have been de developed. 
So far, these initiatives have overlooked important donor priorities, including transparency, protection of human rights and systematic local stakeholder consultation. The OECD UNDP impact standards for financing sustainable development are designed to help donors, development finance institutions and asset managers integrating impact consideration into investment practices and decision making. The standards include provisions for embedding human rights consideration and local development needs in decision making, thus reinforcing the development imperative of leaving no one behind. These provisions also represent a clear public sector stance on improving transparency and accountability of investments to achieve sustainable development goals. Initiatives such as the European Union's new Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation and the revision of the Non-Financial Reporting Directive show that investors and corporates will be increasingly held to account for the positive and negative impacts they have on people and on the planet. Let me emphasize that impact integrity is at the center of the Italian development cooperation agenda. We are proud to have supported the process of creation of the standards since its very beginning and throughout the 10 months of consultations. The Italian Agency for Development Cooperation is fully committed to adopt a, res a results-based management approach and the Italian cooperation system as a whole committed to be transparent and accountable in all its investments, whether it be loans or blended funds, multilateral funding or bilateral projects. The Italian Development Cooperation considers the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals at the heart of the national strategy and action in alignment with the impact standards. In this regard, the role of our development finance institution, Cassa Depositi e Prestiti, is of fundamental importance. Cassa Depositi e Prestiti has published its sustainability framework in June 2020. The challenge is to apply the sustainability framework and the impact standards in investments in least developed country and more specifically in priority partner countries. Positive signals in this direction are already visible. To conclude, let me emphasize that we welcome the direct involvement of the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation in this exercise through the participation as co-chair of the Community of Practice on Private Finance for Sustainable Development. This demonstrates Italy's commitment to push forward the blended finance and impact agenda. The Italian cooperation system will continue to actively support the community of practice initiatives in its next steps. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks to Marina and Italy uh, for their inputs. And uh, just to remind you um, that, of course, this is an interactive discussion. You've got loads of great questions coming in. I will try my best to, to seed those throughout the following panel discussion. And do check out the, um, the chat panel as well, um, where you can, you can see how you can um, start posting about the standards on social media and uh, use the hashtag uh, impact for SDG. Uh, we appreciate your support on that. Um, we're now gonna go over to our panel discussion and uh, we've got some great um, speakers from impact policy makers and practitioners. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at a few key questions and dropping down into the detail there. But among those questions are, what are the impact standards role in bringing greater harmonization to impact measurement and management? What are, is the added value of the standards for, for donors and other investors who want um, to have greater accountability and transparency 
on their investments with the private sector. Uh, and particularly, we're looking at the um, to hear about the practical experience from our speakers and hopefully uh, from you in the audience on what these standards um, could uh, and do mean to you. So keep those questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to introduce our great set of panelists very quickly. They can um, introduce a bit more about their work as they go. Uh, with us this afternoon, we have Fabienne Michel, uh, UNDP SDG Impact. Um, and Fabienne is director of UNDP's flagship, flagship SDV Impact SDG Impact Initiative Program. She is tasked with developing uh, the standards to accelerate investment towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Uh, and Fabienne has 30 years of executive experience, including 22 of those with S&P Global, uh, the Data Information and Analytics Group. Uh, she's also co-chair of the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiatives Technical Working Group, and uh, interim co-chair of the Australian Advisory Board on Impact Investing We'll hear from Fabienne shortly. Um, we also have with us Cliff Pryor. Cliff is CEO of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing. Um, and of course, the GSG, as it's known, is the Catalyst Group for Impact Investment and Enterprise. Uh, and previously, Cliff was CEO of Big Society Capital, which is the UK's wholesale social impact investor and market developer. Uh, he's also previously been CEO of Unlimited, the UK foundation for social entrepreneurs, and previously CEO of Rethink for people affected by severe mental health. He's also worked in healthcare, elder care, social housing and homelessness. Uh, and has participated as a government regulator and advisor across several social issue areas uh, and has uh, co-founded several social enterprises also. So great to have Cliff here with us. Um, we also have Julia Calder, Deputy Director of Innovative Finance Programs at Global Affairs Canada. Um, the Innovative Finance Programs have a focus on mobilizing private sector funding for development priorities. Uh, and Julia is an experienced international development professional, having managed um, international assistance programming for over 15 years with both the Canadian government and uh, the international nonprofit sector. Prior to her current position, Julia most recently served as First Secretary of Development at Canada's Embassy in Colombia. Great to have Julia with us. Uh, and our final speaker is Andrew Herskovitz, Chief Development Officer at the US International Development Finance Corporation, uh, or shortened quite regularly to DFC, for many of you will know. Um, as Chief Development Officer, uh, Andrew oversees interagency coordination on development. And he particularly creates and implements metrics for evaluating the development performance of DFC's portfolio. Uh, and he manages the strategic relationships there with private sector entities. Uh, and he also serves as an ex officio member of DFC's Development Advisory Council. Uh, prior to that, he um, was the coordinator of the US government's Power Africa program from 2013 to 2020 and served overseas as mission director, deputy mission director and regional legal advisor legal for the US agency for, um, for international development, USA, in a number of countries across Latin America and the Caribbean. A great set of speakers um, with us um, this afternoon. Again, keep your questions coming in and we'll try and get them in as we go. We're gonna try and take a high level perspective um, to begin with from Fabienne and, and Cliff. And I'm gonna ask Fabienne to come in and just start off with the building blocks really on what impact measurement and management is uh, and why it matters. Fabienne, can you give us a, a sort of kickoff um, sort of introductory 101 on what we're doing here and why it's important? Sure. Thanks, Hugh, and um, and welcome everyone. Thanks, thanks for coming, and um, it's it's a delight to be here today. So I think I'll actually reverse the order um, and actually start with why um, why it matters because um, I figure a lot of the times no one really cares about the what unless they understand the why. So I thought I'd start there instead. Um, so impact management matters. Uh, because our current systems and practices are not serving our long-term interests well. And they're increasingly unstable and not responding at the pace and scale we need them to. 
The system we created for ourselves that enables us to internalise profits and externalise costs isn't sustainable. And it's a system that has got us to where we are today, where we're facing major global climate and social crises. Um, we've largely gotten away with it. Um, not everybody, but a lot of us have got away with it in the short run uh, since the Industrial Revolution, which seems a long time ago, ago but um, in economic terms is, is a short uh, time frame. Um, and our time is really running out, I think. You know, the system, the, the, a system that seeks to uh, create infinite profit from finite resources uh, has an expiration date. And I think that that date is fast approaching. And I think we're seeing a lot of different initiatives, um, not just in the impact space, but, you know, um, stakeholder capitalism and, and other initiatives are all circling around this issue that our current system is no longer sustainable and, and people are looking for what that next um, um, uh, next uh, system looks like. So, you know, long-term trends uh, such as climate change, accelerating biodiversity loss, uh, increasing population growth and uh, inequality, uh, making social, environmental and economic outcomes increasingly interdependent and, and the clock's ticking. So we're not on track to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. The 17 goals and associated targets that um, uh, were agreed upon by all UN member states in 2015 as being critical uh, to underpin our future prosperity and equity. And COVID-19 has only served to expose uh, and exacerbate existing inequalities and set progress against the SDGs back several years. But it also presents us with an opportunity to build forward better. Uh, collectively failing to achieve the SDGs will have far reaching consequences for humanity and the planet, but ultimately will also reduce economic prosperity and the sustainability, resilience and financial performance of businesses and investments over the longer term. So the private sector does have a vested interest in achieving the SDGs as well. And, you know, I think what we need urgently is a new way forward. Um, you know, it's the right thing to do. And some of us will be motivated by that. Um, others, others of us will be motivi motivated by the fact that it's in our self-interest to do as issues such as climate change and inequality are massive constraints on economic potential. So this makes impact management and advancing sustainable development in line with the SDGs uh, increasingly important and urgent. We're at a crossroads and um, we really need to look at whether or not we can capture this moment and opportunity uh, or uh, are we actually going to just retreat to a short-term purely economic and financial decision-making prism that reinforces the existing inequities and puts further stress on our already fragile social and natural systems. Um, effective impact management is about radically changing the way we do business and invest and maximising positive social and environmental impacts alongside financial returns. Impact management is proactively managing the material positive and negative, intended and unintended, economic, social and environmental impacts of our business and investment decisions on others. So that's people and planet with the intention of avoiding or significantly reducing negative impacts while increasing positive impacts and including contributing positively towards achieving the SDGs. To be effective, impact management needs to be holistically integrated throughout business and investment decision-making processes. And that's including, as um, has been highlighted in the structure of the standards, through strategy, management approach, disclosure and governance practices, and take into account the impacts that are caused or contributed um, to directly or indirectly through operations, supply and value chains. Impact measurement uh, is is about assessing expected impacts and then monitoring actual performance over time and evaluating results. Uh, it's an integral part of impact management, but on its own, it's not sufficient. Um, it doesn't tell us if we're doing uh, if, if we're doing or measuring the right things, and it doesn't necessarily tell us what to do with that information once we have it. And um, while we were developing the standards, uh, we, we really tried to leverage what was already out there and actually, um, you know, make sense of, of what's already available through um, uh, uh, through the current market infrastructure in this space. But what we found were the biggest gaps were around the strategy and governance sections. So we really looked to fill those those gaps. 
Um, therefore, it's more useful to focus on impact management with impact measurement as an integral input um, within an effective uh, impact management system that supports making better, more informed decisions and trade-offs. The, the last thing I want to end on in this section is just to, just to um, uh, call out that impact management is not the same thing as ESG integration. You know, ESG integration is a more inward looking financial risk management strategy in how a lot of people use it. It's less concerned with the impacts of the business and investment on others and more concerned with how ESG factors impact the financial performance of the business or investment, which um, is, is short-sighted and paradoxically will systematically underestimate future financial risk, especially as impacts and dependencies become increasingly interre interrelated and interdependent. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, I suspect, as we go through the panel. Right. Thanks, Hugh. So this is very much a, an output um, uh, set of standards here. ESG integration, very different, very kind of um, sort of input based, if you like, but, but definite overlap between the two, as you mentioned. Maybe it's worth just dropping in a, a question here because it, it does um, dovetail to some of the points you made, Fabienne. But uh, so one of the questions is asking, what is the difference between these impact standards and the SDG impact standards uh, for private equity funds, bonds and, uh, and enterprises? There's a number of different standards out there. It's worth just getting this um, sort of clear from the get go, I think. Um, do you want to take that? Absolutely. So they're very, they're, they're very well harmonised together. There's, there's slight differences in structure um, around, um, you know, the key constituents and users of the standards and also in the balance between what's in the standards and what will be in the guidance. But overall, they're very well harmonised. And, and I look at the standards as a suite of standards and that this is actually, um, you know, an amazing um, collaboration where we've brought together the work that OECD was starting with the work that UNDP um, has been working on on the standards for bond issuers enterprises and private equity funds, that together with these standards um, for uh, donor countries and their private sector partners, um, actually create uh, a shared language and approach um, to integrating impact management and contributing positively to the sustainable development goals um, across different actors and pools of capital. And as we've also heard from some of the, um, the, uh, the presenters already today, that opportunity to bring different pools of capital together to work differently to innovate and solve um, for some of our most challenging problems is, is a really key opportunity. Um, and so, you know, this, this really provides an opportunity for, um, you know, for creating the, that harmonisation that's needed to drive innovation and blended finance solutions. So, you know, when I look at them, and I'm sure that um, Priscilla would, would, would say the same, it's very much a suite that's connecting different actors across the system together to be able to, to collaborate around solutions going forward. Yep, really good efforts to, to start to speak to those different standards that are out there and, uh, and overlap and complement where, um, where necessary. Thanks for that, Fabian. We're going to move on to Cliff. Uh, and I'd really like Cliff to talk to us about um, where we're at on the, the arc of impact investment in terms of its development as a, um, effectively as, a, as, a, as a, a way of investing. And then to, to talk to us about um, why and how standards like um, these OECD impact standards um, matter and, um, and, and how that's the case. Cliff, great to have you here, over to you. Thanks, Hugh, and, um, and thanks to, uh, to Fabian. Um, you, Fabian, you've really set the scene there and um, yeah, the, the climate crisis is with us already and Fab, as, as an Australian, you will know that very up, up close and personal over the last couple of years in Australia. Of course, um, developed economies can have got the capacity to rebuild pretty quickly. Um, emerging economies don't have that. And of course, the social challenges in emerging economies have been here for a very long while. There is a lot for us to do and uh, it is no longer avoidable. So um, for us as the GSG, we see impact investing or have seen impact investing as optimizing risk, return and impact to benefit people and planet. Um, doing so by uh, setting specific social and environmental objectives alongside financial ones, having a, a management approach to deliver the impact goals and measuring achievement. So intention, management, measurement. But there are some very big changes happening and that have already happened. 
you go back 10 years and if you talked about impact investing, it was really for specialist investors, boutique um, into social mission organizations. And let's for the moment call that impact 1.0. Whereas now in many countries, uh, impact is about mainstream asset managers creating intentional impact funds into companies, development finance, call that impact 2.0, much bigger scale, but still pretty small in the great scheme of things. And now coming over the hill really rapidly, impact measured in every investment fund, in every comp company decision, impact as standards, as regulatory reporting, as transparent impact accounting coming along. Uh, let's say that's impact 3.0. All of these are valuable. The right kind of impact activity, the right kind of the usage of the term impact in particular relevant goals and situations. Um, so where is this taking us? And there was a discussion there about um, ESG uh, being inward looking. If you add in um, you know, it, impact measurement and management and are transparent about that, you're shifting ESG quite significantly towards uh, outward looking, um, looking beyond the immediate um, bottom line to the long-term bottom line for, the, for, the, for people and planet. So that's where I, th I think these new OECD UNDP standards, I can't say the whole thing because I, I, I don't have enough breath um, to bring all these tools together. And I think to do it in, in a really powerful and valuable way, you know, impact measurement and management used to be only for very intentional impact investing. And there was quite a separation, a separation between impact investing and development finance. Uh, also a, a, a big differentiation between impact investing and ESG um, framework uh, investment. But these new standards, uh, particularly for the field of development finance, um, take it much further and, and bring things together. Um, and Again, you know, different fields, bringing them together, bringing in impact management and, manage, uh, and measurement, bringing in transparency um, with these standards. Um, I, I think we've, we've, we're bringing in many more investors, more of the investment that's required with much greater integrity um, impact intention, impact management, impact transparency, it's transformative for development finance and I think um, for, uh, for the future of investing generally. Okay, Cliff, what's your sense of what, what's new here? Well, there's quite a few questions who are going back to the first question a little bit. You know, we've got a number of standards out there, IFC, um, operational uh, operating principles, of course. Um, there's, there's a, you've seen a few standards in your time, I'm sure. What, what's new here, do you think? And what's the relevance to um, private sector impact investors alongside uh, donor organisations? We'll come to some of the differences there, of course, shortly. But so give us your sense from the, the private finance world. Yeah, I, I think that, that you know, it's, it's actually bringing things together that previously have been separate. So if we think about um, impact management and, and, and measurement, uh, the, the externalities as well as the internalities, if you like, if you bring that into an ESG framework uh, fund, you're, you're, you've shifted it a long way towards, uh, towards impact. And if you've brought in transparency, there is no hiding place anymore. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's a really major connection. And then if you add in the, the kinds of things that, um, uh, that the uh, development finance world look at, uh, things like you know, aligning donor and partner country priorities, um, uh, having regard to how you leave people in, in the emerging e economy, how you engage with the end recipients. Um, if you bring that in as well, then you've got a much more powerful, um, uh, much greater integrity, much greater transparency of, of development finance. So I don't think any, any one of these items is new. Putting it together, putting them together is what's new. 
Okay, great. Thanks for that, Cliff. Let's let's go over to um to Julia and Andrew, and we'll bring in we'll bring back in Cliff and Fabienne uh, subsequently. But um, uh, Julia and Andrew, both uh, I'm going to use the abbreviations because, like Cliff, we, we could be here a long time if we try and uh, and, and spell out all the names of the organisations. But both GAC and, and USDFC have different um, ways and mandates for um, for thinking about development impact. Julia, can you talk to us first about um, the, the approach uh, of GAC uh, and what um, in, the intentions are behind what you do. And then we'll, we'll get into a few of the more granular kind of discussion points. Great to have you here, Julia. Sure, well, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for you know, inviting me to be part of this conversation and providing a little bit of, of Canada's experience. Um, so Global Affairs Canada is a, is a donor government agency. Um, we, we deploy uh, official development assistance or international aid um, to, to meet our, our mandate and our objectives. And I guess, broadly speaking, our mandate, uh, the mandate for Canada's international aid is, is to help reduce poverty in developing countries. Um, and we do that with a focus on, um, on vulnerable groups and, and, uh, and women and girls in particular. Um, but I think when we're using, uh, you know, ODA or, or aid funding, um, it, it comes with certain uh, constraints and accountabilities around that. Um, and so you can imagine that, that for us, um, development impact really is at the center uh, of, of our mandate and of everything that we do so that we can ensure that, uh, that, that we're achieving our objectives and achieving our, our mandate. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm listening to some of the other panelists speak and, and it's really resonating because I think um, from a donor perspective, we really, uh, you know, we, we really look at, at having a focus on results or on development impact as being core to our entire business process, you know, from, from the, the strategic level to the individual funding decisions um, to, to the, the monitoring and reporting of, of the funding that we've already provided. Um, all of that trying to come back to this idea of, of poverty reduction. Um, but maybe I can get a little bit into what's new for us as well um, in speaking to, uh, to, the, to this community. And maybe um, before you do that, Julia, just, just, just give us a, 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 clear, um, a clear idea of how you decide um, how you decide on what's material to, to the organization in terms of meeting that agenda. What, what do you use at the moment? And then maybe we can go on, come on into, into what you see in front of you with the new impact standards. Sure, I mean, so we, it really depends on the sector, but I think in the, in the development community, we have any number of tools that can help us determine, determine the, the, the relevance or the, the effectiveness of different development approaches to be able to, to achieve our objectives. But I think overall, what they all speak to is, is, is that kind of um, causal results chain, um, telling a bit of a, a theory of change or a story um, that, that helps us determine that an intervention or an investment on one side is eventually going to have downstream development results or effects in a developing country. And I think it's that, that story or that results chain is what we're always looking for um, when we're assessing new ideas for, for their development impact. Yeah. Okay. Great. And and um, looking at these new uh, impact standards, how does that fit with what the way you think already? How, how is how how might it evolve that thinking? I mean, you had a bit of chance to digest the, the standards, think think about their implications. Give give us your sense on uh, on how you're gonna you've been looking at them and will look at them. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, donors, Canada and others have been looking at, uh, at, at how to achieve development results and how to manage for results for a really long time. But, but what's different for, for certainly for Canada right now and what we're a little bit newer to is the idea of um, using some of our, our aid funding, our concessional funding um, to catalyze more private sector investment towards those uh, impact goals and objectives that we have. Um, and I think that's what, what these standards are going to really uh, help us to achieve. I think, I think for Canada, we really see the potential of, um, of, of donor funding in to play that catalytic role to, uh, to, to mobilize additional private sector financing. Um, but, 
but mobilization in, uh, in and of itself is kind of only part of the equation. I think beyond mobilization, what we're also looking to see um, is that funding is, is addressing market failures and that it's, it's actually getting money flowing to underserved markets in a way that is, is ultimately um, improving economic development and, and reducing poverty in developing countries. And I think, um, you know, that's where having specific standards that, that we can use, as, as, as others have said, as a, as a framework or as, as a guidance point when we're engaging with, um, with potential partners um, is really helpful to kind of outline our own uh, development approach um, and to also get a sense that uh, impact considerations are central to uh, to the investments that that others are pitching to us, and that there's a um, you know a process in place, or that there's been some thought being put in place to being to being accountable for the the impact that is being suggested through the through the investment. Um, and maybe I can give a, you know a particular example just to make it a little bit more concrete. But so the innovative finance programs in Canada, these these are newer programs, the ones that I'm working on that are looking specifically to uh, to catalyze more more private sector investment for the SDGs. And one of our um, uh, first investments uh, has been with uh, Grantco, which uh, which is part of the the private infrastructure development group. Um, and I know many in this community are are familiar with Grantco. Uh, but they um, they provide or, or they focus on financing instruments like local currency guarantees um, as uh, as a way to help address some of the barriers that that are constraining private sector investment from reaching really challenging markets. And so I think that kind of model is really interesting to us as a donor because it's both looking at um, this this idea of mobilizing additional finance, uh, but more than that. It's, it's helping to direct those uh, new sources of, of private capital to um, you know, in investment opportunities that explicitly target low income or, or fragile contexts where we know the money isn't currently flowing. And I think that's just one example of how you can get to that, that um, causal results chain from an investment to the downstream impact that it has on um, on actual citizens in developing countries. But I think it's, it's that articulation, as I said, that I think is something that we'd wanna be looking at. And the impact uh, standards are, are what are providing us with that, as other people have said, with that common language that we can use when working with uh, potential new partners on some uh, investment ideas. Great, thanks for that, Julie. That's a really useful example, actually, because that, that's, that can be quite a tension there between the, the donor side of things and, and adding in private finance and thinking about how those two can uh, can be allied. Um, Andrew, let's let's talk. Let's do the same thing with you. Talk to us about your uh, the the approach of US DFC in, in terms of its mandate uh, and its intentions, and then we'll drop down and uh, and do the same thing, looking at how you think about impact um, within the organisation and and, um, uh, and particularly how you look at the uh, at what's important to you. You've been doing a lot of development of your own internal system. So let's talk about that, Andrew, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, thank, I just want to thank OECD DAC for the really collaborative and thoughtful approach that you put into the, developing these impact standards. They're really powerful. What's critical for all of us, though, is to get and cut through all the bureaucratic gobbledygook of what, what's in here and focus on the most important phrase in the document, which is leave no one behind and making sure that the investments that we're making are actually affecting people. And in fact, I, I was looking through the chat and there was a comment from Zafundo Setole from South Africa saying, how do these benefit low-skilled individuals with little education? And that's the approach that DFC is taking. Um, when the U.S. Congress on a bipartisan basis passed the BUILD Act to create DFC. Um, the goal was to do make sure that our investments were leading to development. That's what BUILD stands for. It's better utilization of investments leading to development. There was a recognition that our predecessor agency, OPIC, um, was doing great work and doing development work, but there wasn't not necessarily that clear linkage to making sure that the investments were actually impacting people. So DFC has actually been following this approach that's laid out in the impact standards. We first, one of the first things that we did last year was that we um, uh, launched our very first development strategy called the Roadmap for Impact. 
And the Roadmap for Impact was, wasn't an easy document to get through, but we did it in a very collaborative way. We wanted to make sure that we were focused not just on the quantity of our investment, because I don't really care how much money we're investing. What I care about is how those investments impact people. So we set investment targets, but for each one of the sectors that we identified, we identified specific metrics about how they were going to impact people as well, whether it's access to potable water, access to electricity, access to the internet. We want to make sure you can draw the line between that money that's being going out the door and how it impacts people. The other thing that we've done is where we um, developed our, our impact quotient, which our, is our impact measurement tool, really state of the art. It was developed in consultation with more than 50 different stakeholders, including clients. And it's the way that we evaluate each project on, on an individual basis for its development impact. We look at what the projected impact is going to be. We develop a plan for how we're going to monitor it. And then we also have a plan for how we're going to evaluate the project. And we look at it across three broad sectors. Inclusion, how is it going to impact people? Um, growth, so economic growth, how is it going to contribute to, to the, you know, to, to financially? And then also innovation. Is there some development innovation here as well? And things get scored. But what's critical also is going to make sure that we're not harming people is that we also actually offer deductions for negative ESG impacts as well. It's a, it's a tool that's a living tool. Um, some people have criticized us because we don't share the scores. And I was actually the one who pushed back on this because I wanted us to, because it's a living tool, I wanted to adjust it. We're only in our first year. In fact, recently we made a decision to double the amount of points we can deduct for negative ESG impacts. So um, we are very transparent in terms of how the tool works, but in terms of sharing the scores, it's something we're not ready quite to do yet because we're still fine tuning this. DFC also has a development advisory council of people who, from, you know, from academia, from civil society, from business, who provide oversight to us in terms of, of how we're achieving our development mandate. We've got um, an independent accountability mechanism as well. And then you've got me, I'm the chief development officer, a brand new position that was created. Um, by the Build Act, and my job is, I report, first I report directly to the board, but to make sure that DFC is in fact living up to its development mandate. But it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge for development finance institutions to evolve to the point where they're focused primarily on, on the output, the development impact, because there's always going to be this temptation to pursue the much larger projects that are going to produce greater returns, especially for those DFIs and IFIs that have to earn a return for their, for their shareholders or their taxpayer, whomever it's gonna be. The most important change, and I'll wrap it up with this, Hugh, that, that people gloss over with the establishment of DFC is that DFC is funded through an appropriation from the US Congress, which means Congress recognized that they're gonna give us money for the purpose of achieving development. They didn't say that they're gonna give us money to make money for the US taxpayer. We have to have appropriate financial performance, but ultimately our goal is to achieve development. Yeah, great, thanks for that, Andrew. And thanks for, for talking about the do no harm aspect as well. There are a few questions that came in on that. Just out of interest, the IQ system that you've developed internally, how do you reference that to standards like the OECD impact standards or, or other ESG um, references out there in terms of developing your own system, but based on best practice in the market? So one of the things we're doing in the new Biden-Harris administration is we're making sure that we've got alignment with the SDGs. And so that's going to be woven through our IQ scoring system as well. It's going to be woven through our, our large school, our, our large scale, develop, our, our high level portfolio wide development strategy, the roadmap for impact as well. So, so we're going to keep on working on uh, drawing clear linkages between the two. And we're probably going to be adjusting some of the metrics that we're looking at as well. Yeah, great. I'm gonna uh, just uh, drop in a, there's a question I'd like to put to both you and Julia actually, which is how, you, a couple of questions are coming on this. How do you work with private sector organizations in what you do uh, and how easy or difficult is it to do that? We'll start with you, Andrew, and then we'll go to Julia and then maybe we can come back as well and speak to Cliff and Fabienne about this. It's an important area yeah. for, for really yeah. trying to scale up. Yeah, so um, that, 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 that's 100 percent of what we do is we achieve development by helping the private sector um, finance projects. So we either invest in private sector companies or projects. Um, we provide financing. Now, the challenge that you face is that a lot of companies they just want the financing or the investment. So you have to create an incentive for them to make sure that they're providing you the data that you need in order to 
properly measure the impact. I always often offer the comparison. If I, I come from USAID, which is a grant agency. Um, you know, USAID, let's take USAID decides to grant fund a solar project in a country. Well, not only do you pay for the project, you also pay the contractors to collect data for you from a monitoring evaluation standpoint. And they get compensated for that to then report back to you about the development impact that you're having. DFC takes a different model. We provide a loan to the company that's gonna build the solar, the solar project, but we expect the company to then also provide us the data and collect the data, but they're not getting compensated to do that other than through the loan. So we need to rethink also sort of the stick and carrot approach that we use towards our clients. Because ultimately what we're doing is we're saving the US taxpayer money by providing financing instead of a grant. But we're also not recognizing that the private sector is providing a value to the US government by essentially doing development work for us. So we have to work closely and create incentives for our clients to make sure that we're collecting uh, the data necessary to measure our impact. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Andrew. Julia, do you want to jump in on that? Um, just give us a sense of what you're doing um, in that kind of blended finance area, uh, if, if that is what an area you're, you're developing. Yeah, so for Canada, I mean, it's, this, is, this is new to us as, as a donor agency. Um, you know, Global Affairs Canada is probably more in line with, uh, with USAID, the way Andrew was uh, describing it. Uh, but we are um, dipping our toe into blended finance and trying to do um, and trying to work more directly with, uh, with, with private sector partners through these innovative finance programs that I mentioned. Um, and, I'll, and I'll say that, you know, we're, we're, we're still learning every day. And it's, it's some, sometimes a challenge for us for many of the reasons that Andrew mentioned that, that from a, a donor perspective, um, you know, we're, we're traditionally a granting agency. All of our systems and processes and frankly, our culture is based around uh, granting funds. And now we have uh, these, these new financing tools, which are uh, repayable financing, which are effectively loans, um, which require kind of a different level of engagement with private sector. And, and as Andrew mentioned, uh, you know, different expectations around who will be doing the monitoring um, and, and measuring of impact and, and who, um, who takes on the onus of making sure that, uh, that we're linking investments to those downstream development results that are so important to us. Um, I, I think there's, uh, there's a lot to be learned there and we're, we're mostly uh, you know, testing out as, as a small program, different ways that we can do that. Uh, we're looking at working more closely with our, our, our bilateral uh, DFI, FinDev Canada in some, in some um, occasions and in others, we're looking at, uh, you know, working directly with with fund managers that uh, that are that are investing in developing countries. Um, but it's uh, it's 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 certainly a new area for us and one that we're we're pretty excited about actually. Great, thanks for that, Julia. Uh, lovely. Let's go back to to Fabienne. I, I we've had a, quite a few questions in Fabienne about how these new standards um, relate to organizations like the UNPRI, to what's happening at the, the EU sustainable finance agenda level. Give us a sense of how you've taken, uh, and these standards have evolved alongside those big regulatory initiatives and, and other investment bodies. Sure, so uh, in, in terms of actually uh, uh, conceiving and designing the standards um, in the first instance, we started uh, by actually looking at a lot of the existing principles frameworks in place and really looked to um, align the standards um, with with all of the um, relevant principles that, that that we could see. So, you know, we looked at UNPRI. Um, uh, you know, the UNPRI is interesting because, you know, it's it's actually undergoing a, a change at the moment. But um, but if you look at its six principles, uh, its, um, you know, primary focus in the first instance is around um, ESG integration with a secondary focus on um, complementarity with, with outcomes for people and planet. Um, so, uh, you know, the standards have more of a stakeholder um, uh, materiality um, built into it, um, I, you know, I would say then than the principles of PRI. But, um, but we also looked at the, um, obviously, the IFC open principles. Um, we worked uh, alongside um, UNGC as they, was, as they were producing their, um, their CFO principles for integrated SDG financing. Um, we also took into account 
the UNEP-FI principles for positive um, uh, impact finance and, um, and responsible banking. And, um, and what we really tried to, to achieve was to make the standards um, align with any or um, all of those principles frameworks so that if you're following the standards as a user, you will um, be uh, um, uh, uh, effectively um, uh, also in line with those various principle documents. So, you know, to Cliff's point earlier that it was about bringing things together, it wasn't necessarily about duplicating effort. It was very much a sense-making tool to actually, um, particularly with the principles, provide that next level of detail that, um, that you know, people were really calling for to be able to implement those principles in a, in a consistent um, and robust manner. So, um, so then, uh, you know, with the, you know, with the, the standards as well as um, those principles frameworks, we've obviously um, integrated uh, the, um, the IMP, Impact Management Project um, uh, conventions, the five dimensions of impact and the, and the ABCs, uh, as well as the SDGs into the core of the standards as the core language for impact. We've also um, uh, integrated the UN Guiding Principles for Human Rights and other um, frameworks such as um, the UN uh, Women's Empowerment principles, UNGC's 10 principles, et cetera, and, um, and other frameworks that, that are already, um, uh, you know, providing excellent tools such as, um, you know, on the metric side, you know, um, the, 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 the IRIS plus uh, metrics, which are already uh, aligned with the SDGs and the IMP framework, um, the Capitals Coalition um, uh, frameworks, um, the SVI um, principles, uh, you know, around um, involving stakeholders and the like, and that will become much more clear to people as we as we release the, the, the guidance um, for the standards as well. So, you know, really, um, you know, really what we've tried to do is make the standards the organising system that helps to bring all of that together and provide the necessary context that allows those tools to be used to best effect to create and optimise um, uh, impact along the way. Right. Thanks for that, Fabienne. Um, Cliff, let's bring you in uh, on that. We, um, we were talking earlier about this um, the, the sort of increasing relationship between private sector investors and, and the sort of public sector type organisations. Give us a sense of what the thinking is amongst impact investors in the private sector about more of that, those types of blended finance um, structures uh, and, and just how, how the, the private sector impact investors are thinking about the, the right standards to use and the way to use the, the sort of the various standards that are out there that seem to have slightly different areas of applicability. But give us your, your kind of um, sense of where that is. Yeah, okay, I, okay I, I'll do that in, in two pieces, if, if I may. One, one on the general and the other on emerging uh, economies in, in particular. So in the general one, I think what, what we just heard uh, from Fabienne, that, that enormous litany of different, uh, different standards and, and you know, how we're sort of trying to sort of piece them together in some kind of equivalence of, um, uh, of you know, quantum physics, having, having an integrated field theory and can you put all these together? Um, it did, and and I, I just looking through the, um, the, the Q&A, so many questions about you know, which standard should we use? How, which, which standards are relevant here? How do we know which standards are, are most, most relevant? And you know, I think that level of complexity is, uh, uh, is, is the, the, the industry struggles, the, the finance industry really struggles. It struggles whether it's in, in, um, uh, you know, in, in, in any kind of finance, but I think perhaps there's a, a particular overlay in development finance, a, 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 another level of, of complexity there. And, um, you know, what can we do about this? There are some really earnest efforts and you know, you've heard some of them and OECD are helping and UNDP are helping, IMP, etc. cetera. Um, one of the things that we're doing in um, the second half of this year is uh, taking a, um, an industry view um, piece of work uh, with the G7 and the G20, an industry view of you know, how, how from the industry side uh, does this harmonize, does this, this mix of different uh, standards work and how would it most usefully be harmonized um, and that that's a piece of work that we hope to to be launching very very shortly 
The other thing I'd come to though is, um, is how this looks for emerging countries. And just, to, just to, where we are with the GSG, currently 33 countries, um, very strong in Latin America and, and Europe, um, developing in, in Africa, uh, also in North, uh, North Americas. Um, we're aiming at 55 countries with covering two thirds of the population and over half of people in low income countries. And why are we doing that? We're doing it for the reason that, um, and looking at the Q&A that Dolika Banda um, uh, flagged up, which is, you know, where is the voice of the emerging economies um, in this? Uh, it's, it's not good enough that everything is designed from Wall Street and City of London and Brussels. That's really not good enough for uh, the future that we all want to see, the successes of the SDGs. It's not just the, um, you know, it's not just some countries doing good to other countries. It has to work by and from all countries. And the reason why um, in the GSG we're trying as, as uh, rapidly as, as we can to bring other countries into uh, the impact fold in, um, in the global south is that that voice of the emerging countries has to be heard. Uh, we, we cannot have impact another feather in the cap of Wall Street and um, City of London, etc. It has to be a global piece. And that's, um, that's a very challenging um, question. I'd also like to say um, a big hi to uh, Edwin from Social Enterprise Ghana, who was asking about um, localized uh, impact measurements and standards, because again, most of the metrics that are used for um, impact at the moment are designed for the global north. They're designed for, for larger um, investors and larger companies. Uh, when you go into countries where 80% plus of the economy is MSME um, rather than big corporate, um, you need something different. And you know, I think this uh, this set of standards starts starts to recognise this in in some of the uh, points that are made around um, alignment uh, with part, part, uh, partner country priorities, um, etc. We need to hear that much more much more strongly. Um, so dealing with the complexity, but having a uh, a global system which is genuinely global, not just for um, developed countries, which can have highly sophisticated systems. Cliff, there's, there's quite a few questions out there which I'd sort of bracket in the how how real world are, the, are, the, are standards like this in terms of um, getting impact entrepreneurs up and running on the ground, dealing with the real world situation of creating impactful businesses and opportunities and initiatives out there. I mean. Do they just sort of talk the talk to those people who who do and not necessarily walk the walk, or can they really start to drive different? No, look, I, I, I think there's I think there's there's huge progress. I mean, in, in terms of pure impact investing, you know, we we, we expect the uh, 2021 data to say the first trillion um, ESG has obviously you know sort of uh, gone off hugely if we put in. Um, impact measurement and management and make that transparent, we can bring a lot more capital um, into, into this field. So I think all of that is, is really positive. It's um, the, the, the thing that I really struggle with is, is how we get over um, the, uh, how we get over the, the, the barriers to get the money where it's needed and to get the uh, development capacity where it's needed. Um, so, you know, a lot of money goes into sub-Saharan Africa and just stays in the local banks. It doesn't actually reach the MSMEs because the ticket size is wrong and et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of, of barriers there. Um, and, um, you know, we, 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 as I say, we, we need the kinds of uh, impact tools that MSMEs in uh, emerging countries can use. Um, so I... I I think I think there is there is a, a, a lot of a lot of development, um, but these these gaps and some of these gaps need to be um, 
handled through uh, blended finance uh, or through the use of catalytic finance. So for example, for example um, far too many of the uh, impact companies um, being generated in sub-Saharan Africa are led by um, people from the global north. Why is that? Because um, people from the global south creating companies are probably doing it first time and funders do, uh, uh, um, investors do not like a, uh, a first time fund. We can get over that through catalytic finance and through blended finance. And I'll just um, chip in the, the uh, amazing work of the C3 consortium, the Catalytic Capital Consortium, to really understand where you can get the best benefit out of catalytic finance. Great, thanks, Cliff. Let's bring in Julia and Andrew on that. Andrew, do you want to jump in first? Then we'll bring in. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in because one of the look, one of the comments in the chat was, um, "How do we make sure this isn't just geared towards the types of companies that know how to play the SDG game?" I, I, we want to target companies that have no idea even what the SDGs are, because it, it, we can't just be targeting people who are like playing in the development space. We want to target up and coming companies. And figure out how we develop. Uh, I mean, it's very easy to explain to a to a bank, a small microfinance institution, that hey, we want to make sure that that loans are going to the right people, and that we are able to account for the fact that that X number of borrowers have actually never gotten a loan before. But when you talk to some people within business transaction lines, you often get pushback on trying to collect that type of data. Also, no matter how much blended capital you have available, the other struggle that I'm seeing within organizations is the unwillingness of credit committees to move forward on transactions because as Cliff pointed out, even on things like funds investments, people want you to make investments with, with you know, people who are now raising their third fund, who have X amount of capital already in the bank, who have successfully exited. See, it's just this vicious cycle of continuing to fund the same people as opposed to identifying new potential borrowers and clients. One of the things that DFC's um, doing, we, we were launching this product, a much smaller product um, focused on Africa. It's going to be a small business catalyst program that's going to target um, entrepreneurs with loans as small as, you know, as small as even $50,000, but up to half a million dollars for really looking at the low income and lower middle income countries, really the low income countries. Because if you're only going to finance, um, it, it, you know, if you adhere to your current standards, and you're trying to do deals in low-income countries where you have all of these, these established financial standards and what people have to have, you're going to end up financing only large extractive projects and fossil fuel projects in low-income countries. So you have to build a pipeline of smaller businesses out there. And so we all collectively have to do that. But most importantly, every DFI and IFI, before any investment officer comes forward with a project, the question has to be, why are we doing this project? Not look how great this big project that we're doing is going to be, but why are we doing it in the first place? What is the development outcome that we expect to have? Because we're a public institution. That's why we're created. We're not commercial banks. Our goal has to be development. Yeah, absolutely. Julia, do you want to come in there? There was a great question earlier, actually, on how you, how you start to lever much bigger capital. You're doing development work in the face of um, of climate change, which is obviously a huge issue that uh, just sort of in many ways supersedes and feeds the, the problems that you're trying to think about resolving through donor money. But how do you think about your role as really a, 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 a catalyst for investment and, and maybe even within your own organization, demonstrating what you do to help other investors and other actors come in um, alongside you or, or independently? Well, I think I think that you know speaks to this the this this dual tension a little bit uh, on on the need for scale and kind of you know the ability of donors and the catalytic capital or the concessional capital that donors have available to them um, to to be able to 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 really scale up uh, financing for the sustainable development goals and for these big challenges that that the world is facing. Um, but on the other hand, as as Cliff was mentioning. Um, the, you, you know, when we get down to the actual development impact on, on the ground, um, and uh, it's, it's really kind of the small and medium businesses that are, that are actually creating jobs that are actually um, helping to, to, to grow economies and to reduce poverty in developing countries, there's potentially a huge disconnect between those, those, those big scalable facilities 
uh, and, uh, and that, the, that downstream development impact. And I think that's where um, standards uh, are important in order so, so that kind of everybody uh, along the, the chain of that wiring diagram is on the same page in terms of what it is that we're trying to achieve and that we're collecting enough data so that we can build the evidence base that, that this theory is working. I think it's important to point out that, that blended finance is a relatively new field. It's, it's growing, uh, but we don't necessarily have that evidence base yet that uh, that that you know this kind of concessional capital that the donors are able to deploy are are going to be the ticket to um, to really mobilizing more money for the SDGs. I think I think that's why the onus is on everybody to be doing more um, Im impact measurement and management so that we can build that evidence so that we can potentially make the case for more concessional capital in the future. It's this feedback loop, and I think it speaks as well. Some of the you know the questions in the chat also um, are, are raising the issue of risk. Um, and how do we, you know, how, how are we calibrating impact expectations in risky environments or, um, or, or you know, when, when we're looking at risk considerations. And again, I think, uh, you know, a results-based management or an impact management approach is, is a great way to manage risk because you're having that constant feedback loop of, on, on how your investments are actually performing. Um, and then you can adjust your expectations or look at who else needs to come into these structures. You know, how concessional do we really need to be? Right now, without that data, I feel like we're operating a little bit in the dark. It's, it's quite theoretical. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Julia. Uh, I'm going to bring in Fabienne um, to, to really sort of get a sense of what's next for the standards. There's quite a few questions out there about where um, examples could be found, where people can go and source um, best practice information. G give us a few um, directional pointers, Fabienne, on where, um, where things are gonna go now and where um, listeners into this um, session can, can go and find out more or even be involved. You know, quite a number of people uh, have asked if they can be involved, which is always great. Sure. So um, just just before that, I just want to go back to, um, you know, Cliff's comments about developing markets. And I guess, um, you know, on the on the UNDP side, that is the D in the UNDP. Uh, and UNDP um, has a network of 100, over 170 countries. And, you know, with the um, SDG impact initiative um, that sits within the finance sector hub at UNDP, there is a really um, a, a big part of what we're doing is engagement through our regional bureaus and, um, and country office networks. And, you know, very much we're seeing activation on the SDG impact standards, UNDP standards, as being through those regional um, uh, networks and, um, and country offices and local empowerment in terms, of, in terms of actually using them as a tool with, you know, with um, uh, 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 other supports, um, including um, uh, the development of investor maps um, that help to identify investable um, opportunity areas and business models that, um, that, you know, offer potentially, you know, a range of returns, including commercial returns to hopefully, you know, highlight areas where money can go that perhaps um, private sector investors haven't necessarily thought about before. So, so I just wanted to throw that in, but I absolutely ag agree with Cliff and certainly from our perspective through the development process that focus on ensuring that they resonate um, in a developing market context and, um, uh, and, uh, you know, won't potentially end up, um, you know, inadvertently having their own unintended consequences of putting up more barriers has been a really big um, uh, part of how we've been thinking about it. So in terms of... Um, Next steps on the on the OECD um, uh, um, UNDP standards. There are going to be pilots um, uh, that are run as part of the next stage of the um, the rollout and development. So I might leave that to um, someone at OECD to give a little bit more input about um, uh, in, input on um, on the. Uh, UNDP SDG impact standards side, we're actually in the process of developing guidance at the moment. So that will be coming out um, over the course of the year. We're also uh, complementing the standards with, um, with an independent assurance um, program and seal, uh, which we'll be developing through the course of the rest of the year as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, hopefully a lot more information uh, will become available. Uh, the uh, 
for the UNDP side, there's a uh, we have a, um, a, a platform called the SDG Investor Platform. All of the investment opportunity areas that have been identified through the maps um, will be there. The OECD standards will be there. Um, the UNDP SDG Impact Standards will be there. Links to other useful resources will be there. With the um, with the guidance, what we're really trying to do is is obviously give that next level of guidance in terms of how to implement the standards, but also um, uh, links to resources and tools um, that um, that help to, I guess, um, manage that translation process um, uh, for people as well. So, thanks for that, Fabi. A huge amount of, um, of things happening at the moment, and uh, definitely the team at the OECD are available to uh, to try and guide you uh, through. Uh, exactly what is happening out there. We have run out of time. We could keep going, I think, all afternoon, uh, and we may well return uh, to this and and, uh, and go deeper. But um, I'd just like to thank Cliff, Julia, Andrew, and Fabian for excellent interventions, really to the point uh, and pithy. Thanks to them uh, all for their participation. And um, just before we leave the panelists, uh, the OECD have been kind enough to allow me to flag up our own Responsible Investor Europe conference, which is taking place from June 14th to 18th. Hopefully um, you can see that in the chat, um, uh, the, the link to that. And, and the conference we do at RI Europe dives into the huge and complex regulatory developments that are happening at the EU level across the Green Deal, the Action Plan on Sustainable Finance, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, all, all of which are important references in the work of the OECD on the impact standards as well. So we hope to see you there. And we're gonna run a very short visual clip just to segue to our next speaker. Uh, if we could run that now and our thanks to the panelists on this panel, great, uh, great stuff. Um, here you can see the RI Europe 2021 conference. Uh, look forward to um, seeing you there. And we are gonna um, Give the floor now to our final um, speaker for closing remarks. It's great to have with us Grazia Segara from the Italian Agency of Development Cooperation. Um, Grazia is uh, the head of the Office for Development uh, Cooperation for Actors, uh, Partnerships and Financial Tools. She was previously Public-Private Partnership Manager for Civil Society, uh, Decentralized Cooperation and Innovative Tools, also at AICS. Um, we'll go over now um, to Grazia uh, and, uh, and hear her final intervention for uh, today's event. Uh, if we could run that now, thanks. Thank you, Hugh, for the presentation, give me the floor. First, let me thank on behalf of the co-chairs of the community of practice on private finance for sustainable development, all of you connected today for the active participation and inputs, as well as the speakers and the panelists for engaging in such fruitful, constructive and open exchanges throughout the event. And from the speakers, we have heard how useful the OECD UNDP impact standards will be in guiding the process of harmonizing impact management and measure, measurement practices among stakeholders. Uh, Julia, as Julia and Fabienne were saying before, the impact standards give us a common language and a common metric, metrics. Harmonization is crucial for both transparency and accountability aims. As our opening speakers highlighted, the impact standards represent a real joint product of all stakeholders involved in the community of private sustainable finance. This product comes from one year of, of highly consultative process, which included donors, DFIs, private asset managers, CSOs, and experts. The community has been an invaluable platform for discussion, for exchanging views and experiences. However, we should not lose sight of the final objective of the impact standards of the community of practice, which is in concrete terms, enhancing the ability of DAC members to mobilize private sector resources through blended finance approaches and stimulating impactful investments in the SDGs, especially in LDCs. Thus, today's event prepares us, all the community, into the future work, the future commitments, 
Impact standards represent the first fundamental step toward a detailed implementation guidance in order to turn the standards into practice. In doing this, we will continue collaborating with the UNDP, an essential partner for us. The guidance aims at complementing the standards, providing clear step-by-step -step recommendations on how to implement the standards and what compliance with the standards looks like. The guidance will also feature examples taken from the practices of the FIs, asset managers, and the impact investors. We encourage you to participate in the development of the guidance as, in, as its quality will depend also on your feedback and on your inputs. In parallel, we will work on pilot studies. Ilva Lindberg uh, from North Fund as co-chair of the community of practice will coordinate this work, which aims at applying the standards in real life context to specific projects. Both the guidance and the pilot studies will contribute in making the standards drive the real impact. The other pillar, pillar of the community of practice and the OECD's work on private finance for sustainable development is of course, blended finance. The next COP meeting on the 1st of July will discuss the third edition of the OECD Annual Blended Finance Funds and Facilities Survey, as well as more generally, how to mainstream good practice around blended finance through the OECD DAC blended finance principles and their respective guidance. Once again, thank you. And we look forward to working with you all to drive a widespread adoption of the impact standards for financing sustainable development, an important milestone as we strive to achieve the SDGs and to be compliant with 2030 agenda and to leave no one behind. Least but not last, let me thank Paul, Priscilla, and all the secretary team for the great, great work. And thank you to you, uh, to you, you for moderating the session. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Grazia. It's been uh, great to be here. Thank you to you for your closing remarks, especially as Italy co-hosts COP26 this year. Uh, fantastic to have you here. Um, a big thanks to all of our um, other speakers um, during this session, but uh, maybe an even bigger thanks actually to the audience. Um, fantastic set of questions that we've had in real engagement. Uh, and as Grazia mentioned, this is really um, partnership work here. So we look forward to continuing um, that, that discussion with all of you. Um, that is um, it for today. This will, uh, of course, uh, be available for um, re-watching on YouTube, uh, the recording of the session, uh, and we hope you do and pass that on to uh, your networks. Uh, and thank you all very much uh, for being with us this afternoon. We look forward to uh, carrying on the discussion. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, you. Hi, Fabian. Bye. Thank you.